Okay. Um, we continue reading one John, and tonight I'm prepared to finish chapter three if time permits. Uh, first, general introduction, as usual. Uh, one John is one of five books in our Bible that have traditionally been understood to have been, been written by or under the authority of the Apostle John. Uh, the Apostle John was a Jewish fisherman, one of Jesus' twelve disciples, and probably the beloved disciple of John's gospel. One John has been called a letter, um, usually. Um, it's one of the three so-called Johannine letters or epistles, although it looks less like a letter than any other book in the Bible that's called a letter. It doesn't have a, the introduction of a letter or the conclusion of the letter, other features of a letter. Um, one famous commentator of years gone by described 1 John as a sermon which takes the Gospel of John as its text, which is an interesting idea because it does seem that the theology of John's Gospel is, is everywhere present in 1 John. And it's so much easier to understand 1 John having just finished our study of the Gospel of John. So that's good. Regardless of exactly what kind of document it is, it's clear that what's happening in the document is that an apostle and the pastor is speaking with gentle but firm authority to a group of Christian believers. And he's not so much presenting logical arguments the way the Apostle Paul does in, in many of his letters, but this is rather more of an emotional and spiritual exhortation, trying to encourage this group of Christian believers to a right way of thinking, and a right way of behaving, and a right way of loving one another. Clearly, there are some problems among Christians in, in the day that this apostle was speaking to. Some of them are doctrinal. Some people have gone out from the church who are denying that Jesus is the Christ. There are moral issues. A lot of times it's been in one time talking about how Christians should behave and, and how people of the world behave and how that's different from proper Christian behavior. And by social on this slide, I mean all of the words and pages that are devoted in 1 John to the topic of love, how we're supposed to love one another <coughs> if we belong to Christ. And so the church has doctrinal, moral, and social issues which are being addressed in this document. Um, as I keep saying by way of introduction, it's possible to teach 1 John by spending most of the time looking outside the Bible at the historical setting and trying to imagine which particular doctrinal issues or which particular moral or social issues um, John is addressing. But what I've chosen to do instead is to simply read 1 John as it speaks to us because it's my conviction, having studied this for a while, that John is, is living in the same world that we live in, the world between the first and second coming of Christ a world in, in which the same issues that they have are issues that we have. And I find that one John really speaks to us without needing uh, to, to detour into a lot of historical background. Uh, please be patient for about five or ten minutes. I'm going to, as quickly as possible, run through what we've studied so far. Uh, the letter is so short that it seems to me it's 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 okay for me to beg your indulgence to just let me run through all of it rather than try to smash it down and lose something in the process. So, 1 John begins with the author, who never calls himself John, but is understood to be John by, by the church across the centuries. He does describe himself though as one who has seen Jesus and heard Jesus and touched Jesus when Jesus was on earth among men. And so he, he addresses himself to the people as an apostle, one who, who knew Jesus. Throughout this whole document of, of 1 John, it's clear that the apostle understands himself to be speaking to Christians. This is not a document that intends evangelism. It's a document that's addressing issues within the church. Uh, and in particular, the issue of which part of the church is, are genuine believers and which part of the church may, may perhaps not be genuine believers. What he says to the, to the church is that we apostles have proclaimed to you the message which we first received from Jesus. 
And the message that we receive from Jesus is that God is perfect. God is perfectly true. God is perfectly good. There's nothing slightly dark or untrue about God. And because of Jesus' blood shed for them, his followers that are cleansed of their sin, reconciled with God, and willing and able to come into the light where God is and to behave in accordance with God's character. John is well aware that no Christian other than Christ himself is, is absolutely perfect. He says we all have sins, including himself. But the great thing about being a Christian is that when we have sins as a Christian, we can confess our sins. And our sins are forgiven and we're cleansed from all our John says he's writing to them not so that they will sin more. On the contrary, he's writing to them so that they will not sin, but also so that they know that when they do sin, their sins have been atoned for by Jesus. So this is the Christian life. On the one hand, we're not supposed to sin, and on the other hand, we know that when we do sin, that our sins will be forgiven if we confess our sins. So a lot of this letter has to do with, starting early in chapter 2 and then through the rest of the letter, has to do with the question of, how can we tell whether we are truly Christians or who is really, really Christian? And one of the answers that John gives, and he gives it first here at the beginning of chapter 2, is that whether or not we're Christians can be seen by our obedience to the commandments of Christ. Tonight, when we finish tonight's lesson at the end of chapter 3, he'll, he'll speak to exactly what does he mean by the commandments of Christ. But John is saying that one of the ways you'll know if you're Christian is if you obey, if you obey the commandments of, of Christ. And he says that as we obey the commandments of Christ, that perfects our love of God and causes us to increasingly live life that resemble the life of Christ. He says that he's not, this is nothing new that he's saying to them. This whole letter is nothing new. He's saying all of these things that he's saying are things that they heard from the first day that they became a Christian. But the Christian message which the church is built on, is new in the sense that with the coming of Christ is announced the passing away of this current darkness, the evil age ruled by Satan, sin and death. And with the coming of Christ also is announced the new light which is already shining, which is the kingdom of Christ to come. And so the Christian message is new in, in, in that way. He says, in, in the light of Christ, in the, in the church, which was, was created with the coming of Christ, hatred should be a thing that's impossible. And to be a Christian is to abandon hatred, because hatred belongs to the kingdom of darkness, which is passing away. Love belongs to the kingdom of light, which is coming in Christ. This message, he says, speaks to all the Christians that, that may read or listen to what's being said here, whether they're old or whether they're young, just because of their relationship with God. And not because, in case of the old ones, of their maturity, or in case of the young ones, because of their youthful vigor. They're all of those Christians just because of their relationship with God in Christ. And whoever does the will of God, he says, abides forever. But anybody who actually prefers this world which is passing away, this fallen world, this corrupt world, is going to be swept away with the world and everything in it, which is all passing away. And he says, because this dark world that's passing away is in its final hour, which is to say Jesus is coming soon, many of what he calls antichrists have gone out from us. And as they go out from the church, as they leave the church, they prove thereby that they were never really part of the church to begin with. But those who remain in the church, and that's the people that John is speaking to, he's not speaking to the people who have left, he's speaking to the people who have stayed, the Christians who have remained in the church. He says, you're the ones who have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we all, including John and the people he's talking to, have have the knowledge that we need, and because we know the truth, because we know the gospel, we can recognize the lies of those who have left the church. And those who have left the church may have spoken a lot of lies, but chief among them is saying that Jesus is not the Christ. He says they're in a particularly difficult situation because 
to, to deny the Son is to abandon the Father as well and to lose God and Pilate. So people have gone out of the church and sort of gone out to the darkness and away from God's kingdom. Again, he says, and he says it many times, I think, in these five chapters, <coughs> that all what he's saying is nothing new, it's what the church has understood from, from the very beginning. Just stick with it, he's telling them, and then we'll have eternal life with God the Father and God the Son. And the reason why he's writing is not to tell them anything new, but to warn them against these antichrists who have gone out and are now trying to deceive the church. He's trying to protect them from innovative thinking, which is different from the gospel they He's not adding anything new, it's the antichrist who are, who are trying to deceive them. Um, so this is no new teaching. He's just saying, trust the gospel that you had from the beginning. And you'll notice, and, and it's plain enough as I do this review, it seems that there's a lot of repeating here, and there is. One John repeats a few simple messages over and over again. It's, it's the kind of document that it is. As I said before, the Apostle Paul will build arguments, so you can outline his chapters and say, this, these chapters are talking about this, those chapters are talking about that, and Here's the conclusion, but John is not doing that. John, John is trying to make sure the church gets a few simple points. You already understand the gospel, stick with it, you'll be fine. Don't be deceived by the people who have, who have gone out. He tells them, in fact, at the beginning of chapter 3, we already are children. Okay? The world doesn't recognize this yet because it hasn't really recognized God or Christ. But when Christ returns, and that's going to happen soon, then it's going to become apparent to everyone who and what we are, who, what we eternally are, children, children of God. And he says, because we have this hope, this hope that Christ is coming soon and we'll be seen to be the children of God that we already are, what Christians want to do is to purify themselves, even as Christ was pure. If we make a practice of sinning, what that proves is we're not children of God, but rather that we're children of the devil, he says, at the beginning of chapter 3. But a child of God cannot continue sinning, he says, because God see it by it. This is a remarkable thought we had last week in last week's lesson. John is saying that a child of God will not continue sinning because the child of God cannot continue sinning. And the reason why a child of God cannot continue sinning is because God's seed abides in him. <coughs> and as we discussed last week, that could have two meanings, or, or both maybe of them. One is, God's children abide in God. And since God is perfect, if we're going to live with God in eternity, we're going to have to be perfect also. Or it could mean the Holy Spirit lives in us, and that's what John means by God's seed lives in us. And that's why we cannot continue sinning, because the Holy Spirit will lead us increasingly into a Christ-like life and put it into our sin. This ends my review, and in verse 10 of chapter 3 was the last verse we studied before tonight. He says, by this is it, it is evident, and this is a good summary of all that went before in a way. Who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Um, I want to read that again because this point about love that concludes last week's reading begins tonight's reading. All of tonight's reading from verse 11 to the end of chapter 3 is basically about love. So he's been saying all this stuff about what the world is like and what Christians are like, which ends in verse 10 of chapter 3 by saying, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. That's what he has been talking about. And now he has the thought, nor is the one who does not love his brother, which is kind of a subtle shift to a new subject that we'll be, we'll be talking about tonight. Okay? So please keep the last clause of verse 10 in mind as we begin reading in chapter 11. <coughs> so could somebody please read Japanese verse 11 through 13. 
なぜ兄弟を殺したのか彼の技が悪くその兄弟の技は正しかったからである13兄弟たちよ世があなた方を憎んでも驚くには及ばない I'm going to read to us to give Steve a, a slight vacation. The word is given. <laughs> well, this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who, who, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised. Brothers, that the world hates you. Okay, thank you. Well, all right, so 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 says, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. This word for that begins. Verse 11 looks back to verse 10. And you can see in your text, I have here on the slide, verse 10 says in the, in the last clause that whoever does not love his brother is not of God. Whoever does not love his brother is not of God. So then John picks up that thought, continues in verse 11, and reminds us. That love for one another has always been a commandment of the Church of Jesus Christ. This is nothing new that John is saying now because of the Antichrist that went out or anything. From the very first and always throughout Jesus' ministry and the ministry of his apostles and the preaching of all, Paul and all the rest of them, the commandment that Christians love one another is a fundamental commandment. In fact, I think you can very easily argue and be right that it's the fundamental commandment. Jesus says, all the laws and the prophets handle this one thing that we love one another. This is, this is a very important original commandment of, of the Christian church. All right? And then in verse 12, to illustrate this point, he says, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. So he's just said that the church of Jesus Christ consists of the people who love one another. That just as has been commanded from the very beginning. The supreme counterexample, in a way, the sort of anti Christ example that you can get, first of all, in the Bible is Cain. Cain is the very first man who ever committed murder. He's a son of Adam and Eve and the first person that ever murdered anyone, right? So he's the first murderer in, in the history of humanity. And of course he murdered his brother because there weren't that many people at that, that time. He, he murdered his brother. And John understands that this corruption happening at the beginning of the world, God has created the world, Adam and Eve have sinned, sin has entered the world, their, their sons, Cain and Abel, <coughs> manifest the sin in the world by Cain murdering his brother Abel. And that's how we're not supposed to be. Nobody's supposed to be that way. But that's the way the whole world apart from Christ is. It's, it's a world of murder. Okay? And it started with Cain. And why did Cain do this, this work of the devil? As John understands it, why, how did the devil incite Cain to murder his brother? How did this happen? John asks, and so his readers are going to have read this story in Genesis. This is a story you read in Genesis chapter 4, beginning. And if you look in Genesis chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, you'll read there that just before Abel was murdered by Cain, Cain was very angry. And why was Cain very angry? Evidently because, and this is a quote from Genesis chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, the Lord had, regarded, had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. And that's how the story They're the two brothers. God had regard for Abel and his offering, but not for Cain and his offering. Therefore, Cain was jealous. 
Cain was jealous of Abel, and he became very angry. Right, and John understands this to, to mean that the Lord took care of Abel, and his offering had to do with Abel's righteousness, of which Cain was jealous. Right? So, to summarize, the evil, the sin that was in the world there since, since Adam and Eve stumbled into sin, the devil somehow turned into jealousy, the unrighteous brother, Cain became jealous of the righteous brother Abel. His jealousy became anger, and anger became murder, and Abel was killed by Cain. And by the way, the word here that's translated murder is a, is a very strong word. It's only used in the New Testament elsewhere in the book of Revelation, and, it, and it's sort of a spectacularly bloody, evil kind of murder. This isn't accidental death or manslaughter. Or this is premeditated, you know, bloody murder. Is what Cain is, is, is the first one to be, to be guilty of. And that's how we're not supposed to be. Cain is one of the examples in the Bible that are there for us to know how we're not supposed to be. And I think that the author of Genesis had the same understanding that John did that it was <coughs> because Abel was righteous and Cain was unrighteous that God had regard for Abel and his offering and no regard for Cain and his offering and Cain could see that and he got jealous of his righteous brother and killed him right. and I think this is a teaching of the whole Bible you look for example at Proverbs chapter 15 verse 8 but I could have picked a lot of other verses the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to Him. Right? It wasn't because God liked one kind of offering better than the other. It was because He knew the hearts of the two brothers. And what He knew was that Cain was unrighteous and Abel was righteous. Therefore, He was happy to receive offerings from Abel. But the offerings from Cain were an abomination to him. And you remember what God said to Cain in the Old Testament story is, why are you downcast? If you do right, won't you be approved? God's advice to Cain was, become righteous, and, and then I'll accept your sacrifice. But rather than become righteous, Cain killed Abel. So this is a pattern in the world that began at the very beginning of the world with the brothers Cain and Abel. The first of all murders, and in a way the first of the whole sinful world filled with murder, ruled by Satan, who has been a murderer from the beginning. And so John says to the church who he's talking to, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Let me warn you what you can expect, having told us, remembered the story of Cain and Abel. From the very beginning of the world, the first two children of Adam and Eve, and from the very beginning of the church, starting with the founder of the church, Jesus Christ, the world is jealous and filled with hate and murder and comes against God's righteous people. And Jesus said so many times, even in the Gospel of John and elsewhere, if the world hates you, don't be surprised because it hated you first. This is something that we know. The world hates the church. Questions before we... Okay, let's... let's じゃ次を読んでみます。3章の14から15節。私たちは兄弟を愛しているので、死から命を釣ってきたことを知っている。愛さない者は死の血に留まっている。あなた方が知っている通り、全て兄弟に憎む者は人殺しであり、人殺し
we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet does his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So in, um, in, in my mind, there's a kind of a picture that, that I, as I read this stuff, you know, and I, I don't know if this is exactly right, but let me tell you what's in my mind. So from the very beginning, shortly after creation, the world fell into sin, and all have been, ever since have been sinners, except Jesus. So the world is, in John's way of talking, passing away, dark, ruled by Satan, and characterized by murder and all of this other stuff, anger and <coughs> And everything in creation is the world except God's children. God has some children for, for himself. Um, I'll just call it the church, although you have to understand that before Jesus was born, there were some occupants in, in the church. God always had a, had a people for, for himself. It wasn't as clear until Christ came, but this is the situation that we have. We have the world, which is completely corrupt and ruled by Satan, except for the people, that, the children that God has saved for, for himself, which, which is the church. And if you have this picture in your mind as you read this, it may help you see kind of, John is painting gray, black, and white. You know, there's no grays. There's the world and there's the church. There's nothing else. You, you, he's saying, how do you know where are you? Are you part of the world or are you part of the church? Are you going to pass away and die and go into oblivion? Or are you going to live forever with Christ and God? Place? There's only two possibilities. The world is passing away. The church is the light which is already shining and which will continue eternal. The eternal of God's children. All right, so now with that in our mind, let's read this. So 1 John 3, 14, John says, We know that we have passed out of death and into life because we love the brothers. So in, in my mind, it's like this. We know that we've done this. And he's talking to these people. His whole talking to these people who are inside this circle, right? And he's saying, we know that we're in this circle and not in the world, which is passing away. We've passed out of death and into life. How do we know? Because we love the brothers, all right? Inside the circle, which is the church, people love each other. It's, it's a commandment from the beginning, he's already said. This is the commandment of Jesus. Love one another. And because we love one another, including like a group like this, because we love one another, we know that we pass out of death and in, into life. On the other hand, whoever does not love, whoever does not love, can never be in the circle. They're out there. So he's been talking about our behavior, our righteousness, and so on. Now he's talking about love. Tonight we're mostly talking about love. In here, a people that's characterized by mutual love, love for one another, out here is characterized by murderers, like, like Cain. People who don't love, people who actually murder one another or things like that. So from the beginning until now, this sinful world ruled by Satan has hated God's children, especially Christ and his church. Right? 
that's what he's just been saying. Don't be surprised if the Lord hates you. Cain hated Abel. The world hated Jesus. The world's going to hate you if you follow Jesus. Don't be surprised. Because those people outside the church abide in death, not in love. And those people are passing away. It's all going away. It's never coming back and soon, John would say, you know, it's passing away soon. But we know that we've passed out of death and into life because we love God's children. Yeah, translated from death into life. I already said that. Then he sort of continues the thought and he said, Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life. I think John probably has in mind Jesus' teaching from the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus did a better job, job than John was of, of explaining what Jesus basically said, and I'll put Jesus' words up on the board in just a second. Jesus basically said, murder is an action that proceeds from anger or from disregard for another human being. And all of that leads you to hell. All of that puts you outside of the circle, which is the church. Out of, out of the it doesn't matter if you actually kill someone because killing is just acting out an anger that was already in your heart or a disregard for the life of a human being that was already in your heart. Sometimes it manifests as murder, but God sees the heart. The God is the same when you have to kill him or you just hate him. And that's what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 22, which I, I just summarized so you don't have to look it up. So what Jesus said on the same point, part of the Sermon on the Mount, was, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment, right? This is true in all, almost all human societies from the beginning of time until now. Civilizations have to have rules against murder. And murderers have to be disciplined. You can't have a society where people can just murder one another. And one of the main things that governments do is to make sure that people who murder are liable to judgment. That was true in Israel, it was true in Egypt, it's true in Japan, it's true in the United States. Murderers are liable to judgment. So Jesus said, that's not, that's not all. He said, I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. This is something that human society does in its system. You can be angry in human society and not be subject to judgment. But you can't be angry in the church and be free from God's judgment because he sees the heart. You don't have to kill people. He knows you're angry, right? And it's not just that, Jesus said. If you insult your brother, you're liable to some sort of judicial process. And whoever even says to his brother, you fool, will be liable to the, to the hell of fire. So Jesus' point, we, we get it, right? We've read Jesus' teaching often enough, and I think John's point is the same. The world is filled with murderers. Not everyone actually goes close to killing someone. But the heart of everyone in the world is, is basically oriented that way. It only cares about itself. It disregards everyone else. It's dismissive of them. It's judgmental of them. It's angry towards them. Sometimes it even kills them. <laughs> that's the way the world is, and that's not the way the children of God are supposed to be. Even ignoring someone is murder. I remember Pastor Takeshi's sermon from some years ago. He said, if you, if you have such a low opinion of somebody that you just don't even, you just don't even acknowledge their existence, you might as well go ahead and murder them. Because it's the same to God. You've made them disappear from your heart. Right? It's just as if you killed them. So that's kind of the, the Christian way of, of thinking. It started by Jesus himself. So how do we understand what love looks like? Verse 16 says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. So 
Cain is sort of like the anti-Jesus example from the beginning of the world, and Jesus is the perfect example of how we're supposed to be inside the church. The world has been filled with many murderers, almost everyone who disregards the life of other people. Right? Everyone who prefers the world is, is going to be a murderer of some kind or another. But there's one perfect exception among all human beings. The man who was, in no respect, a murderer, right? That's Jesus Christ. And what Jesus did was he came, he lived a perfect life, and then he gave up his perfect life to pay for the sins of all of us while we were still in There's no other example like, like Jesus. But that's how we know, we, we people within the church, we people within God's children, how do we know what love looks like? Jesus. We, we look at Jesus, how he was and what he did. That's a picture of what love is. It's the perfect example of what love is, and it's what we are called to be. We're called to imitate, right? The people who have been redeemed by Jesus and formed into his church are supposed to become like him. That's, that's what the Holy Spirit's doing in us. Even now, it's making us into little Christs, Christians. Okay. Verse 17, just kind of make sure that you get the, the broad the broad point. It says, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? So, for some of us, to lay down our lives for our brothers might literally involve a call to endure torture and death, like Jesus. There have been Christians, many Christians, even today there are Christians who are called to lay down their lives for their brothers in the name of Christ. But that's not most people, right? But everyone in this circle, every Christian, says if anyone, which means to me that practically everyone, is called to share with his brothers in need what God has given to him. I mean, the only person who wouldn't be called to share would be the person who has the least of all, right? But we all have more than somebody. And we all know somebody who has a need. And so, as a Christian, we, don't, we, we may, not, may not be called to be tortured and die, but we're all called to share with of everything that we have with people who are in need, especially among the brothers. <coughs> and John is saying, you know, if we ignored brothers in need, then what that means is, they're not our brothers, and we're not in that circle, we're part of it. You know, it should be impossible for somebody to sit inside the circle and say, I'm a Christian, I love everyone, I love God, I love everyone, and yet be aware of some brother in the church in need, and you have the means to alleviate their need and you don't do anything. This is not Christian behavior. This is worldly behavior. That's what the world is. That's what, that's what John is, is saying. It's a really hard point, you know, because we, we all fall short of, of the ideal, but I mean, it's... Uh, I think we all understand that, right? I mean, Del Dennis used to be able to tell Del stories since, since Del fans. Yeah. Del Dennis used to tell the story about, you know, people in some church praying about, I, I'll pray for you, blah, blah, blah. So I said, why are you praying for me when the answer to my prayer is in your pocket? <laughs> we do that. We, we, somebody needs $10 and we say, okay, I'll pray for you. But what you should do is take $10 out of your pocket and give it to them, then pray for you. Your prayer is never an excuse for not sharing with people if you have, you know, if you have enough to, to share. And C.S. Lewis had a famous quote, he said something like, if, if you say that you love everyone, that may just be an excuse for not loving anyone in particular. Right? And you know people like that too, right? They're all love. Right? You never catch them doing anything to prove it, right? Nothing costs them. So, that's John's point. You know, Jesus showed us what love looks like. And we may be called to die and suffer for our brothers, or maybe not. But every single Christian is called to take out their wall and open up their home and share with people who need stuff. That's part of the deal, to be in the circle. Okay. And he says in verse 18, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, 
but in deed and in truth. And of course, I know Steve, you're a big fan of James. So I mean, James is teaching this stuff. Right? So you know, really like, yeah. um, John is teaching the same thing, and, and it's a it's a teaching of the whole whole Bible. And, you know, the kind of love which Christ lavished on us and then modeled for us is completely self sacrificial, right? I mean, Jesus never did anything for himself. He had all the rights in the world and he laid them all down. Even his right to be divine almost, you know, he, he emptied himself of his divinity so that he could die on the cross and take away our sin. There's nothing we could do to catch up to Jesus. He's, he's provided an example we could never match, you know, but he's shown us the direction that we have to keep going in. <coughs> and that's the direction the Holy Spirit keeps taking us. It's indeed, but it's also in truth. And this is an additional point. So, you know, I said last time by way of concluding, Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. And I have no doubt there are evil people who disguise themselves by giving away a lot of money. But that's not what Jesus is asking. He isn't just saying, run around and give a bunch of stuff away and pretend that you love people. That's not good enough. So if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, <coughs> there's this amazing statement. Of course, 1 Corinthians 13 is all about God. Right? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3 says, If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. So, it's true about the Christian love is self-sacrificial and expensive. And it, 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 you, you, you give your you share your assets and you may even give up your life like Jesus did. But you can do all that stuff and still be evil. You know, the, the, the kind of love that we're called to do is one step beyond that. It, it has to include that. Right? It has to include all that, that self-sacrificial But it has to also involve genuine compassion. Right? It's, Je Jesus wasn't pretending. Right? God is not pretending. God so loved the world that he gave up his only begotten son. <coughs> so when we take out our wallet to help people, when we open up our, our door to give people a place to live, that's part of lo what love looks like. But it's, it's not the content of love. The content of love is I care more about you than I care about myself, right? Or perhaps even more, it means I care about you because I love God. Right, so John is just making sure that we understand. And the general point that he's working on in all of this is that how do you know you're Christian? Uh, your behavior should be righteous, as we've been discussing the last couple of weeks tonight. He's saying, you should love, like Jesus. Loved. And make sure you understand that, I, that we're not pretending to love. We're saying, you should really, you should really love. Okay. All right, so let's keep going. So, それによって私たちが真理から出たものであることがわかる。そして神の見舞いに心を安じていよう。なぜなら休んじてるの？休んでた。休んでた。休んでたよ。なぜなら例え私たちの心に責められるようなことがあっても、神は私たちの心に心よ
God is greater than our heart, and He knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. Okay, so these um, four verses are among the most difficult verses in the Bible for people to cancel. And uh, although I think most people grasp the meaning, and there, there are a lot of difficulties, you know, I spent a lot of time preparing these four verses, so let me see how I do. So it starts out in 19 and it says, By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before Him. At many places in 1 John, when, it, when a sentence begins like this, by this, it's referring to what will follow. But in this case, I'm convinced that it's referring to what went before. Okay, so when he says, by this, we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him, I'm almost positive that he's looking back to the previous verse 18, which says, little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. That, that seems to be the right reading. In other words, the assurance that we truly are children of God, the assurance that we really are inside this circle and not out in the world may be found in our genuine love for the brother. So if we love not in word or talk, but in deed and in truth, if we truly love, if we look inside our heart and say, I truly love you, Billy George, <laughs> then then what that is, is assurance that we truly are children of God. That's the thought that seems to me to be. Okay. And, and then this continues the thought in verse 20. Whatever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and He knows everything. And Kazuko, um, you know, this continues the discussion we were having last week, you know, we were talking about how when you were a teenage Christian and you thought you were right, <laughs> but as you got older, you, you, you realized that you were farther from your ideal, and many of us felt that way. And I dare say, all and most Christians do feel that way sometimes. The Apostle John knows what we're talking about, because here he says, whenever our heart condemns us, Suggesting that our heart does condemn us, right? Not constantly, but often enough that he, he, he wants to talk about those situations when our heart condemns us. Whenever our heart condemns us, we took, well, by accident we talked about that last week. So we have, we're, we're, we're Christians, but our heart knows. You know, that there's stuff wrong John is saying, God is greater than our heart and He knows everything. So our hearts do sometimes condemn us, right? So you, you were saying, everyone was saying the same thing. If, you, if we're honest, our hearts condemn us often. And <clears throat> this is sort of me talking more than the Bible, but I think it's a valid Bible point. When our hearts condemn us, that, such condemnation is sort of good news, bad news sort of thing, right? It's bad in the sense that our heart is condemning us because we found sin in ourselves. We, we, we found something, you know, you're always talking about you're angry or whatever you know, people have. We, we find stuff in ourselves that we condemn ourselves for because we know that we have sins. And John is from the beginning been saying we all have sins, right? We find that our heart condemns us. But it's also a good sign because as you said last time, you were quoting some friend of yours, if you feel that way, it's a very good sign because it means that you found something in yourself which is sinful and you deplore that. Right? You detest the sin that you find in yourself. And so when your heart condemns you, this is a sort of good news, bad news sort of a thing. There's something there to condemn. Sure enough, we don't have it. But on the other hand, we notice it and we don't like it, right? And so 
There are people in the world who have all kinds of sinful behavior and they don't even know anything is wrong. Well, they may even realize that it's what we would call sinful, but they delight in that, right? There's some people that brag about how, how, sinful, how sinful they are and all of the sinful things that they, they've done, right? I, you know, I, I might have been that way a little bit when I was younger. So, so the Christian does sometimes condemn themselves. Right? And John is acknowledging that situations like that. But he's saying when that happens, child of God, God is greater than your heart. And he's saying that God knows everything. And down through the centuries, some people like Augustine and Calvin and, and some, some people in that tradition are there say one of the things that God knows better than everyone else is, He knows our sin even better than we do, right? So you're condemning yourself for this and that, you, you think you're angry, but God knows what your sin really is, right? And, and the same thing with, with any of us, right? We, we, know, we don't even know all of our own sin. God, and God may be showing us over time more and more all of our sins so that we can confess and, and perfect it. But you think your heart condemns you? God sees more than that. Right? But I agree with most of the most commentators who, who say that the message here is supposed to be encouraging and so one of the things that God knows better than our heart also is He knows who His dear children are whose sins have been forgiven for the sake of Christ. So we, we find stuff in ourselves, we have sins, and we condemn ourselves, but God is greater than that. God not only knows all of our sins better than we do, but He knows that we're His children who have been forgiven for the sake of Christ. God knows that. And so, verse 21 says, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence before God. So, my understanding here of this very difficult passage is that even though our heart condemns us often enough as a Christian, we have confidence before God if and only if we know that we've honestly confessed all of the sins that we're aware of. We believe that we really have been forgiven because of, because of what Christ did on the cross at Calvary. God has caused His Spirit to live in us, like we talked about last week, and God is gradually leading us to perfection. We're not perfect, we still have sins. But when we do have sins, we confess our sins and He's faithful to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, like we said back in chapter 2. This is Christian reality, right? We find sins in ourselves, we condemn ourselves, God is greater than our heart. Right. We're encouraged by the Holy Spirit to see our sin, to confess our sin, to repent of our sin. God's Spirit lives in us, leading us in the direction of Christ-like perfection. And when we're in that state, even though we're still sinful and not perfect, we can have confidence before God. We can have confidence before God. <coughs> and when we have this kind of confidence before God, and here's a really interesting point, but I think it's important to get. When we have that kind of confidence to approach God, we receive whatever we ask God for. And why that's true is after the comma, because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. So when we approach God with this confidence, we know God is our Father, we've confessed our sin, all that we know about, God knows that we feel bad, we know that God forgives us because of Christ, we know that God has adopted us as His child, caused the Spirit to live in us, that God is working with us to perfect us. When we, when we know that all of those things, then we can sit down and we can pray to God with confidence. We're not separated by any distance from God because we've been reconciled with God because of what Jesus did. And to the extent that's how we are with God, whatever we ask God, we get. Okay? But the reason why we get it is because when we're in that 
relation to God, we only ask God for the things which it pleases God to give to us. And this is a consistent teaching of the whole Bible also. When you're in tune with God, if I could say it crudely, you'll ask God for the very things God wants you to ask for and that God wants to give you. And so it's God that's calling out the prayer. The Holy Spirit's causing you to say that prayer because that's the very thing God, God wants to do for you. And of course we know that every sinful, wrong-headed prayer that we might say, whether by mistake or willfully, is God won't answer. But God is anxious to give us what we ask for when what we ask for is in accordance with His will. Okay, when it's pleasing to God, what we ask for. And in passing, I'm doing this now a lot, just in case anyone is interested. This very difficult subject of prayer, to me, I've, I've always had trouble understanding prayer, and I find prayer difficult to do. And 1 John 3.22 is touching on one of the very secrets of the kingdom of God, the secret of effective prayer. Namely, that the Holy Spirit leads us to say the prayers God wants to hear and answer affirmatively. And where I really started to get this, some years ago was when I read this book, which I recommend. Billy Graham says this is his favorite book on prayer also. I, I read it somewhere. <coughs> but this book discusses this concept of, that John is talking about. One John 3, 22. All the powerful people of prayer, you know some people who, who pray and God answers? The reason why is because they're praying for the right things. <coughs> They're so in tune with God that they pray for the very thing God wants to do and God's, their prayers are answered. Right? It's a mysterious thing, prayers. So if you're interested, I, I highly recommend this book more than many modern books on prayer. This will, this will get you some distance in understanding this point. And by the way, if, as I start recommending stuff, if you go on the website, all this stuff is, you can see in the notes on the website. Or I, I, I'll put links to the books on the website too, in case you want to go to Amazon and buy it. Okay, these are the last two verses for tonight. Let's do them. So the imashment to you know, coming of Yes Kiristo no Minao Shinji, but I start in the major Tayoni, Tangani, I shall be kicked over there. Coming of Imashme of Maburu Hitoa, coming of you.神もまたその人にいます。そして神は私たちのうちにいますことは神が私たちに賜った御霊によって知るのである。ありがとうございます。ベリーが言う。いや、勝手。ありがとうございます。私は神様の言葉を信じる。私は神様の言葉を信じる
and love the brothers, love one another. Right, so if if we believe in Jesus and, and in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake, if we're constantly involved in, in loving acts towards the fellowship of believers. Everything that we do that's loving is pleasing to God. Every prayer that we ask that's bent towards helping us minister to to our brothers in a, in a loving way is something God wants to do anyway. Right? And so that's when you have powerful prayer. When the things that you're asking for, the very things God wants to see you pray for, and He's so anxious to help you do that. By the way, have you ever noticed that there are some prayers that you know the answer is always yes? I mean, if, if, if you say to God, please make me more like your son Jesus, the answer is always yes, always. Right? That's what God wants to do. And He wants you to want Him to do that, and He wants you to see it happen, right? So such a prayer, is, the answer is always yes, right? Because it's totally God's will. Sometimes we don't know so clearly what, what God's will is, but if our motive is love, we're going to be finding the right prayer and the right activity. If our motive is murder and hatred and selfishness, like in the world, we're not getting any help from God. So, so, in the, and so that's the one commandment. You know, lo love your brothers in, in Jesus' name. This is what Christ commands us. But I think it's also a summary of everything God commands us in the whole Bible. It says here in verse 24, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God abides in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. Right? So, Whoever believes in Christ and loves other Christians has an intimate relationship with God, right? Paul talks the same way. We're in God. God is in us. We're all here in the church of Jesus Christ. If we believe in Jesus and if we love the brothers, we have this intimate relationship with, with God. But again, we, we, we come up to think, how do we know if we have this intimate relationship with God? And the answer that John gives is, by the Spirit, big S, which whom he has given to us, the Holy Spirit. So, the question then becomes, how does the Holy Spirit make his presence in us, known to us? How do I know? The Holy Spirit is really in me. Because if the Holy Spirit's really in me, it means that I'm in God and God's in me. God is pleased. I can pray to God and my prayers will be answered and all of that stuff John's been talking about. But it all depends on the reality of the Holy Spirit living in me. And this isn't just some sort of like philosophical concept, right? The Holy Spirit is God. And when he says the Holy Spirit lives in you, they mean the Holy Spirit lives in you. God is living in you. And, it, and it's in a way that you have to be able to detect because John is saying the way you can know is by the presence of the Holy Spirit in you. Right? So how, how does the Holy Spirit make his presence in us known to us is a really important question. <coughs> Does anybody want to help me answer that question? I mean, how, do, how do you know the Holy Spirit in you? Whenever I'm sharing the gospel, I feel like this, you know, how you get goosebumps? That's how I feel. Okay. So you, you have a, a, a kind of spiritual or emotional sensation that, that the Holy Spirit is And that, I don't know if it's exactly the same, but when, when I show you what I thought of, in, in, in Romans, Paul talks about the spirit of adoption that causes us, you know, our spirit and God's spirit crying out, Abba, Father. It may be close to that, but I mean, Paul's talking about the same thing. We do have, not constantly, I'm 
I, I feel that we do all sometimes have just the feeling of the presence of God in us. So that's, that's one way, right? What's another way? The other way is that we can feel the presence of God in us. So that's one way, right? What's another way that you know the Holy Spirit is in you? And sometimes that we feel that the joy, uh, joy uh, came to my mind. Okay. So I, I know that uh, God accepted me and pleased me and Okay, so that's that's also a. There may be there may be sort of ways of feeling the presence of God. In your case, you said during evangelism. In your case, when does joy come to you usually? This kind of joy. Oh, that the song. I I I knew that I did that the song that the, I something that got to please the thing. Okay, so you 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 feel like you've done something that. Yes. Must be pleasing to God, which which is and joy uh, came to my mind. Okay, any any other thought? What? Like from, yeah. Peace, uh, uh, even though you are in hey, the storm. Storm. That's a really good answer, right? The Bible says the peace that passes all understanding. You know, it is. <laughs> is <laughs> it must be supernatural because your circumstance is not peaceful at all, but but somehow. Suddenly you're so peaceful, right? And no one way you can explain it is God must, must be with you. Yeah. I think we, most people have that experience. Well, you know, we live in Tokyo, right? I mean, I just meet people all the time. And, you know, sometimes I don't like feel like I want to talk to people. Who don't talk to you. When you run into somebody you know, I think that's from God. You know, the divine appointment is just encouraging. You know, so. Okay. Yeah, and I think, you know, people who are. Christian will look into the world and see God's hand everywhere. Right? I mean, I, I think on the one hand, if you're not a believer, you might look at the universe and wonder if God is even good, right? Because there's natural disasters and there's all kinds of evil and things in the world. And you wonder what, what that means, right? But, but once you understand the gospel and you understand something of God's character, then you can look at the beauty and nature and see God. Right? And, and, it, it may be hard to explain to Richard Dawkins, you know, but, but, but as a Christian, you can look at the starry sky and see the, the glory of God, right? And that's, 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 you know. Any other stuff? So usually when I uh, look back for the world, I was in tears, and then when, especially when I was in the, the the difficulties. Yeah. The uh, Then I look back at all oh, the, the so Holy Spirit was. Right. So that was the first thing I did just because we talked about it last time. You know, we talked about the leading of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 14. And by the way, if anybody wants a copy of the article about it, I put it on the back of the table. Um, but. A teaching of the Bible, and I think we find it in our life, is that when we become a believer, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, and, and the Holy Spirit is real, and powerful, is God, and His intention is to lead us away from sin, into righteousness, and Christ-like life, and finally on to a blessed eternal life, you know, where we'll be sinless. And the process is, is, is not instantaneous, right? But like you said, after you're going as a Christian for a while, and you look back, it can be quite amazing, actually, when you realize you never would have thought you could have gotten to here. And the only way you can explain it is God did it, right? I have things like that. I know I didn't do it because I could never have done it. But it happened. So it must have been God who, who, who did that, right? So the, the leading of the Spirit is that way. Some of the stuff you guys said, I, I saw Romans 8, 15, where Paul talks about the Spirit of adoption. We have an emotional or spiritual, however you want to describe it experience of, of the presence of God. You, I feel God is so close to me now. And other times, you probably feel God is far away, right? I mean, that's also part of God's The pastors at TBC in recent weeks have been preaching about the fruits of the Spirit, right? Which is another answer that, that you can give from Galatians 5, 16 through 25 and other places in the Bible that, that speak similarly. These are evidences of, of, of this picture, right? I mean, pe people in the world give bad fruit, and people who are children of God should give good fruit. And 
that's abuse so increasingly as the Spirit leads, right? And so that's another answer, how you can see if the Holy Spirit is in you. But you see, John's point is, all of our assurance depends on not our effort, but on God's activity in our life. The assurance is not that we're trying really hard to be good. The assurance is God is in me. I'm a child of God and God is leading me in the right direction. And I can yield to his leading. And it might be bumpy, but I'm going to get home. I'm going to get home to heaven because God's in control, not me, right? But how can you know God's in control? And that's what we're talking about. You, you need to find evidence of it because it's real, right? Some of it's emotional. Some of it's you can, objective, right? You can just see it. Or maybe like you were saying, you, some of the things that happen in your life, they seem really improbable unless God is doing that, right? I, I think have, the fruits of the Spirit. But tonight's lesson, is, is pointing to one thing mainly, and that is that the greatest of all of these indicators, right, is love, right? A true love of God that's expressing itself continually is genuine self-sacrificial love. Every Christian should be able to see that in others and themselves, and to the extent we see it, that should be very reassuring. And to the extent we don't see it, that should be one of the things we confess to God and, and, and ask Him to help. Because I think that's the one thing, if you have to say there's one thing that you need to look for, it's not the warm, fuzzy feeling, it's not the amazing stuff you think that you see happening in the world, probably most of which is true. It, it may not even be, you know, how, how your life has changed, although I think that's a better indicator, but if, if your life is expressing love, spontaneously, generously, because of God, and especially for your Christian brothers and sisters, that's a sign, John is saying in tonight's lesson, that should really reassure you. That's how you can know the Holy Spirit's in you, because nobody's like that unless the Holy Spirit's in you. The world is like Cain. The church is not. The church is like Jesus, right? And, and so, and it's conforming itself to Jesus all the time. So, Jesus was self-sacrificial, Jesus was righteous, but Jesus wasn't pretending. Jesus was doing it because he really loved people, and so, so, should, so should we. Okay. Anyway, that's John chapter 1, John chapter 3. Thing. Sorry, I'm really worried. I should pray because it's late. Did anybody have anything they really want, wanted to say though before we pray? Especially if you think there was anything that you need to correct from what we So this is not an easy chapter actually to, to leave. Just for your interest, I mean this is an academic point, but in the history of reading of, of or John chapter 3. There's a lot of little details people struggle with, but there's only one main issue of understanding. And that is that, that the reformers tended to, to read that God is greater than your heart in a sort of more condemning way. Right? You, you condemn yourself, but God is greater than you. God knows you said more than you did, right? And, and that probably wasn't the right way to read it. John seems to be trying, in general, to reassure people. But of course, both things are true, and I try to keep both things together, because God will show you your sin. He knows your sin, will show you your sin. But the Gospel is, you can confess your sin and be cleansed of all unrighteousness, which still restores your, uh, your boldness in approaching God in prayer. And so Knowing that the Holy Spirit's in you is, is really comforting. Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear God, as always, I ask you to protect us from mistakes in teaching and in understanding. Uh, we know that we can't really understand anything except uh, the Holy Spirit is involved in teaching us. And so we ask you, Lord, to, to take responsibility for our understanding. Please cause these things to go into our minds, more importantly, into our hearts um, in ways that are transformative. We hope that by the time we spend here, we don't just learn stuff, but that we're actually improved um, as children of God, that we're 
that we're growing and changing in ways that, that your word can accomplish in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Please help everyone here to, to pick up something uh, that they can uh, take to heart and be changed by and will improve their life. Me too. We thank you for this church and ask you please to bless all of the people who worship here and minister here. Uh, Lord, we know that, that uh, the church is not perfect, that we Christians often have sin, sadly even within our church, and we ask for your forgiveness whenever sin creeps into our church. Please forgive us and, uh, and lead us back onto the right path always. Uh, and we know that you will do that. Please help everybody get home safely tonight, and as many people as you want to come back next week, please bring them safely back again. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.